Let me invite you to take out your copy of God's Word, and I know you're thinking Nehemiah, but I want you to go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. For uh, over 10 years, every Sunday, I have climbed onto this stage and said, take out your Bibles or turn on your device, and I've told you to turn to a passage, and we've tried to faithfully walk through it. Over the last few weeks, we've been faithfully walking through uh, Nehemiah, but Nehemiah chapter 5, if you were reading ahead this week, deals with loaning each other money in the church and charging interest. In a few moments, you're going to realize why that doesn't really set for today's topic, all right? So I want you to join me in Philippians chapter 1. In 2009, I was in seminary at New Orleans Seminary, primarily taking classes in Birmingham because of the after effects of Katrina, when a youth minister from Elkdale named Bob Frazier asked me to come preach at a Wednesday night back-to-school rally. What he didn't tell me till years later is I was his third choice. I came down, I'll never forget the night, because as I came down, some car hit a power pole, the transformer went out, the church was dark, the band played acoustic that he invited in to uh, share, and I preached with the door propped open by the sunlight while the kids sat in the dark. Probably better for them that way anyway, right? In that same service, there was a deacon in the room. Leith Wilson was serving as a deacon, and he was in charge of finding supply preachers. So he came up to me afterwards. Now, granted, I was 27 years old, wearing jeans and flip-flops at a cool youth rally. He came up to me afterwards and said, hey, would you be interested in supply preaching for us? And I said, sure. Sure. And I'll never forget Brother Leaf because he said something that has always made me giggle. He said, well, I have two dates available. And I said, well, do you want me to do both? And and he said, and I quote, you better just choose one. (laughs) So I came and preached one date, and then they asked me to preach another and another, and then that turned into a uh, December series. And you got to remember... At 28 years old, in seminary, never pastored before, I only had three good sermons that I traveled around with, and good is questionable at that point. So I began to preach for you in 2009. By the spring of 2010, you, so faithfully in coming and attending, made sure that the search committee knew my name. In fact, I learned later that there was a box in the lobby where names were put in and suggestions, and you began to stuff the box for me. Oh, how you've regretted that from time to time. And you you stuffed the box for me. And so the search committee began to meet me. I'll never forget that. One Sunday I came to Supply Preach and they said, Hey, after church, would you mind meeting us and visiting with our search committee? Now that Sunday, Robin and Scott Little were supposed to feed me lunch after I got through supply preaching. So I got through supply preaching and I went to their home and they fed me lunch. And, and I'm, I'm sure it was good. I don't remember, but I'm sure it was good. And, and Robin, being so soft-spoken and laid back as she is, uh, said, Hey, don't you want to be our preacher? And I s- didn't have the ability or the articulation to try to say, Well, I'm uh, actually meeting with... Well, I'm, uh, I said, Oh, well, thank you. Can I have some more mashed potatoes? Right? Uh, I didn't know what to say. So they took me for an interview and they led me out to Pete and Louise King's house. I don't know if you've ever been to Pete and Louise King's house, but GPS can't find it. I wound it down the road and met there. And the first person to meet me at the door on the search committee was Steen Trailer. If you know Steen Trailer, he is a gray head, grizzled faced, hard working man. And I thought, oh, Lord, this man's about to kill me right here in Marion, Alabama. In fact, as I met Steen at the door, he shook my hand and smiled and became one of my closest friends and one of the coolest dudes you can ever meet. We visited there for a while. They asked me some pretty hard questions. Uh, They asked me about my thinking and preaching and and my experience, which I had none at the time, so that was an easy question. Uh, And then they asked me about becoming the pastor. So in February of 2010, you voted for me to become your pastor. That's almost, uh, or that is, 11 years ago this month. What a decade we have had together. I tell you that to tell you this morning, church family, that over the last few months, my wife and I have felt the calling and we have accepted the invitation to go and preach in view of a call at Brushy Creek Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina. I tell you that because you are my church, you are my friends, and you are my family. 
Some pastors will go and preach, be voted in, and then come back and read a letter of resignation. I would never think to do that to you. It never crossed my mind all along that somehow I would sneak out one Sunday and sneak back the next to tell you I've got a job. I'm going next week to preach in view of a call. Now, certainly, they could, as a church, vote me down, and I'll come back and ask for a cut in pay and a place in the nursery. But I don't think that'll be the case because the Lord has been walking with us. I want to tell you about it. I want to tell you about where I'm going. I want to tell you about what you've meant to me over the next few moments. About uh, August of last year, this church received my name from a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who knew, obviously, my brother in the state of South Carolina. He didn't necessarily have anything to do with it other than they knew him and found me. They reached out to me in August and asked me some questions. Up until then, I have never felt led to leave, never looked for a church. In fact, family, I tell you in all honesty, I didn't even have a resume. I had no reason to put one together. I would brag on you for just a moment by saying over the last couple of years, I've had several calls about coming and being interested in leaving or finding another church. I've had some uh, leaders in our denomination ask me if they can put my resume in certain places. And that's for several reasons. One, I'm fairly young and have a few years left in me. Uh, I certainly have some education, which people think it matters in those kind of things. But mostly the reason why people call is because you're such a good church. Because this place is so healthy. Because you've been such a blessing to your community and to your pastor that others take notice in that. But I've told them, no, I've never wanted to leave you. I've never felt led to go. But this church reached out and after a conversation and another and another and another and a couple of uh, visits and time together and um, them uh, coming down here, uh, a few uh, came in and, and uh, sat and, and saw your love for me and my love for you and our love for God's word. Uh, they have asked us uh, if we would come uh, and be their uh, pastor, their senior pastor. Um, now, when I thought about telling you this news, when I thought about sharing it with you, when I thought about uh, how this would go, I was working through Nehemiah chapter 5 all week thinking, well, I'm going to preach normal. I'm going to get up and preach Nehemiah 5. That's what you do. You preach the Bible. And then I realized that would not be fair to you. So what I want to do is I want to share with you my heart by looking at Philippians. Would you look at Philippians with me this morning for just a moment? Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 8. Paul is talking to a church he loves dearly. And this is what he says to the church that he loves dearly. He says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, and I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for all of you are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Would you pray with me? Father, for a few moments now, I would ask you, Lord, to, to give us what we need, and that is your presence. Through the power of your word, Lord, may you minister to us in a special way this morning. In the safety of this room where we share life together. Father, would you help us? Would you help us see your hand and hear your voice and trust your path? Lord, I thank you for our time together each and every Sunday as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul is talking to a church that he loves. A church that has supported him and cared for him and sent him on mission and that is exactly the way I feel about you. I'm talking to a church that I dearly love. Part of the reason why this is difficult for us is because, and I mean this in all honesty, we are not leaving because we're tired. We are not leaving because the church has worn me down or worn me out. We are not leaving because the church is somehow fractured or broken. In fact, I, I would say to you that right now in this moment, we are as healthy as I've ever seen us in the decade I've been here. We have a wonderful staff who serves the Lord faithfully and loves you dearly. 
We have men of God who lead in the room of deacons, stable and steady. You have a church that is affectionate for one another. Even during a pandemic, we've baptized people and see folks join our church. We are financially as stable as we have ever been, not a single note of debt to our name and a facility that God has blessed. And so for us, part of this idea of transitioning has been hard because it is so good to be here. It is so good to be with you. And the idea that Paul writes in Philippians is simply this. I love you. I love you. In fact, I, I want to show you two things Paul says that I think I can say. And that's simply this. You have made me, you have brought me great joy. And there's two reasons for that. The first one is simply this. You have brought me great joy because my mind is full of joy when I think of you. When I think of you, my mind floods with joy. My mind is overwhelmed with joy. Look at what Paul says there in the first chapter in verse 3. He says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you. Every time he thought of this church, he burst into a prayer and a song of thanksgiving to the Lord. That's been my thinking. Well, every time I think of you, I think of joy. Now, that's not to say there have not been difficult days and hard challenges and rough moments and You've put up with me and I've put up with you and we've worked together, but overwhelmingly and far and above anything else, when I think of you, I think of joy. And there are two reasons for that. The first one is the people. When I think of the people of Elkdale, I'm full of joy. I think of the people who, when I was barely here as your minister, crowded around a nursery to watch Addie be born. I think of a people who got out of bed in the middle of the night when my wife had a car wreck and met me there to help me. I think of people who have volunteered for 10 years to teach my children Sunday school, Bible school, and RAs, and music. I think of people who have gotten on planes with me and traveled to the other parts of the world to share the gospel, who've driven across state lines to spend a week at camp to share the gospel. I think of people who have gathered around and prayed. I think of deacons who have put their hands on me and prayed for me in times of struggle and strife and uncertainty. I think of church members who, when I was facing some early financial challenges, Blessed me anonymously so that our family would be okay. I think of you. I don't think of Elkdale as attendance or budgets or buildings. I think of people. I think of people who love me, who cared for me, who've loved my children and cared for them. I think of people. I think of some of you who have uh, put up with me and, and, and labored with me. I think of you as you've sat those first couple of years wondering if I'll ever figure out how to preach patiently. I think of you. When I think of the joy of this church, faces flood my mind. I would tell you of a few, and I pray as I tell you of a few, you would not feel left out if I don't mention your name, but I think of Hilliard Rush. Hilliard is a deacon in the church that's long been with the Lord for several years. Hilliard was my first friend in the church. Now, the reason why Hilliard was my first friend in the church is because Pat, his widow, would drop him off of the church and leave him in my hands. (laughs) And we would drink coffee. and We would go visit the elderly and the sick. And Hilliard had a way of just getting to the truth. He would always say to me, Pastor... In the book of James, it says, for a man to know what's right in his heart and not to do it, it is a sin. I wish folks would just do what's right. He helped me. He shaped me. I think of Elton Reese, who sat in a deacon's meeting after having multiple knee surgeries and struggling with his health and worried and fearful of retirement, sat in deacon's meeting, weeping from his eyes and said, you don't know how long the night is until you can't sleep. A grown man who loved the Lord just pouring his heart out with another group of men and we prayed together. I think of Frankie Cahoon carrying her oxygen bottle into the choir because she loved to sing. I think of Doris Talbert's chicken casserole being delivered to my door. and Danny Mantle loaning me a tool. And Will Roberts telling me he's going to teach me how to turkey hunt by setting me in a mosquito patch. (laughs) 
I think of you. When I think of the church, I think of you. And I love you. Not only do I think of the people, but I think not only of the people, but of the partnership we have together. Look at verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now. I think of you and I have joy because of who you are, but also of what we've done together. We have a partnership in the gospel. We've served beside one another. We have carried our babies to the Lord in prayer and we've went around the beds of those that were sick. We have celebrated when the baptistry was full and wept when the cemetery was sad. I think of the partnership in the gospel. I think of the years we have labored together to share the news of Christ. I think of the joy we've had hand in hand proclaiming the gospel. The partnership. We have a partnership, as Paul would say here in verse 5. The partnership in the gospel. You know of that partnership because if you've been here at any time, you know I'm going to tell you. That partnership begins in the fact that Jesus Christ has saved us. That partnership begins in the fact that all of us in this room come from different places and different locations and different educations and different backgrounds and different areas of the world. But we landed here as a church and we landed here as a family because Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave to forgive us of our sins. We have a partnership in the gospel because we once were beggars far away, destined for death, and Christ has saved us. Some of us were near, some of us were far, but we all came by the cross. We have a partnership because Jesus has saved us. He has rescued us by His death, burial, and resurrection. We have a partnership because we've worked to share that gospel. We've sacrificed to give money. We've gone to foreign places. We've burst into the schools to share the good news of Jesus. We've handed out food. We've high-fived at fall festival. We've worked to share the good news of the gospel. We've suffered in the gospel together. We've suffered through hard days and tough decisions and struggles. We are partners because of Christ. Jesus would say, or John would say in John chapter 1, verse 12, For as many as received Him and have believed in Him, they have the right to be called sons and daughters of God. Because of the gospel, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. My mind is full of joy when I think of you. Secondly, and this is where I'll conclude, my heart is full of joy when I think of you. Look at what Paul says. <laughs> In verses 6 through 8, he says these words. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul says he moved from his mind that when I think of you, I have joy. Now he's in his feelings. He's in his heart. He's down in his, his uh, internal language. And he says, uh, because of your partnership in the gospel, I am sure of this, that Christ will fin it. He says, in my heart, I know this. The Greek word here for heart literally means bowels. It's the idea of down in his stomach. He knows deep down in his gut that he loves these people. Now, some of you have given me some gut trouble over the years, but I love you. He says, I love you. I love you. And this is what he says about this love. Notice what he says. He says, I love you in my heart for, for really two reasons. One, because of what God will do. I love you because what God will do. Look, look at what he says in verse 6. He says in verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. He's speaking about the future. You know, there is no greater comfort for a Christian when they are hurting than to think about the future. 
There is no greater joy for us than to think about the future. And when we think about the future, we have a short-term and a long-term view. In the long term, we know that the Lord will return and make all things new. And that all of the struggle and strife of this life will be washed away in the presence of Jesus. But in the short term, we can also be confident that God is working on our behalf. That God is moving for our good. That God is always up to something and it's always good for His people. That He cares about us. Paul says, I am sure that God will complete a work in you. He could not stay in Philippi. He had to go where the Lord was leading him. He had to move from there. But he was confident, even as Paul left, even as his physical presence left at that congregation, he was confident that the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, was still there and still working and will finish what he started. One of the things that today you might be thinking is, well, what's next? What will we do? Where will we go? And the wonderful thing about asking those questions is, first, it certainly endears itself to me that you have such an affection for me that, that you're struggling with life post Corey or maybe post Wendy anyway. But it's also a chance for us to say, for every question we ask God already knows the answer for every uncertainty we may face God is already working so Paul with confidence says I'm sure God will finish what he started that's why I have joy in my heart today that wherever the Lord may lead this congregation I know that it is the Lord leading this congregation and that He has your good and His glory in mind. God has no unfinished task. There are no unanswered questions. He has a great plan. Secondly, I am full of joy in my heart, not only because of what God will do, but because of what God has done. Look at verse 7 and 8 again. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and my confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I, I feel this way and it's right to feel this way because I know what God will do, but I also know what God has done. We are partakers in the gospel. I have love in my heart because of what God has done through our congregation. God has reached people for the gospel. God has sent people around the world for the gospel. God has bound us together for the gospel. We have walked through ups and downs and struggles and strife for the gospel. And God has done this. And I have joy in my heart when I think about what the Lord has done in and among us. We are partakers together in this gospel. That He has done this. He has labored with us. And then I would draw your attention to verse 8. This is the verse that I most want you to hear this morning. For God is my witness. How I yearn for you all. With the affection. Of Christ Jesus. I want nothing else. But for you to know the Lord richly. And to follow Him faithfully. And be found worthy in His eyes. Week after week I've tried to preach to you the Word of God in order that you might be fed and shaped in the image of Christ. Prayer meeting after prayer meeting, Sunday school after Sunday school lesson, mission opportunity after mission opportunity. The whole goal is that you might be shaped and know the Lord. I yearn for you. I long for you. <coughs> To know the Lord Jesus more fully every day of your life. One of the ideas of being a pastor is simply this. The book of Hebrews says that, that I will give an account for how I have led you. That, that part of my responsibility is, is putting in front of you every opportunity to grow and know the Lord. I want nothing else than for when you finish your race to hear from the Lord Jesus, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so I love you. 
And I long for you to do that. To run the race that God has set before you so that you may hear from the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let me share with you for just a moment what it will look like over the next few weeks. Next week, my family and I will travel to the church. and We will preach in view of a call. If the Lord sees fit for them to affirm me as their senior pastor, then we feel the Lord has led us to accept that position. We will return back and serve you for several weeks. I know that Brad, your deacon chairman, has already begun to pray and think about how to lead you as a church with the deacon body and have no doubt that those men will do well. We will return and and share with you for a few more Sundays together through God's word. I hope it will be a time of of sweet remembrance and joy and encouragement to one another. Uh, And then we'll begin to figure out the process of transitioning uh, to uh, a new place. Um, But I I want you to know I'm I'm not sneaking out. I'm not running away. I'm, I'm making sure you're aware of what's going on. I want you to be on this journey with me. So can I ask you to do me a favor? Would you, over the next few days, maybe even the next few weeks, would you pray for me? Would you pray for my family? Would you pray for us as we move our children, as we uproot our lives, as we try to obey the Lord? One of my favorite verses as of late is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. In fact, I shared it with you last week. It says, we make it our aim to please Him. My heart's desire is that I would do what would honor the Lord. I pray you'd help me seek that. I'd like to pray for us for a few moments. I'd like to ask you just to bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Father, I... I thank you for the words of Paul this morning because they are a balm to our soul. They are an ointment that we need. I thank you, Lord, that that Paul, writing to a church that he loved, articulated the very thoughts and feelings that I am experiencing. That he would say, as I would say, when I remember you, I'm full of joy. When I see what God has done and is doing, I'm full of joy. When I know what God will do, I'm full of joy. Lord, I pray this morning, as we gather in this room as a family, as as friends, as loved ones, as your people. Lord, I pray more than ever you would make yourself known to us in a special way. That we would feel the overwhelming peace that comes with trusting the God who's over all things. That there is nothing outside of your view. That God, you lead and we follow. Father, I pray for my church. I pray for the people who for over a decade have loved me and supported and cared for my family, came faithfully with their Bibles open and even when they couldn't come, tuned in to see what was happening. They've given of their lives, they've given of their time, their talents, their treasures. They've encouraged, they've, they've helped me hold, hold me accountable. They've, they've followed my lead graciously. Lord, I pray for this family in whom I love dearly. God, I pray that over the next few days and weeks and months, you would just surge in this place with such a spirit of unity and excitement. God, you have been working here and you will continue to work here and you are building something special and sweet. And Lord, I know that even as as the next man of God who's called to lead, Lord, I know he will he will press them on to be even more fit to see you. 
God, I'm thankful that as you see my steps moving away, you're already preparing the steps of the one who will come. I'm thankful that this church is made up of believers who do not worship a man. Uh, They are not clinging to a pastor. They serve you. You are the God who is worthy of our worship, our minds' attention, our hearts' affection. You and you alone. Father, I pray. I pray in a special and, and, and sweet way that you would press on each and every heart of the people of Elkdale. How much I love them. God, I thank you that by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we are family now and forever. That we are bound together and that we are headed to Zion. And there is coming a day where the trump will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and those who are left behind will meet them in the air and we will be with you forever around your throne. Every nation, tribe, and tongue declaring you are worthy. And I'm thankful, Father, that no matter where our feet may go on the geography of this world, when the day comes, we will all be together with you. That you are our Savior and Lord. And there is no one like you. And I pray, Father, that every person in this room and and listening online, that, Lord, they would think soberly and clearly and And Father, that they would know that you love them and that you are the purpose of their life, the center of attention for them. God, I pray for the one who may see the example of the Hortons and say, you know, God's been calling me to this or that. And it's time for me to say yes. Father, I pray that your face may shine upon us. That you will turn to us and give us peace. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Congregation, I'm, um, in light of this morning's uh, events, I want to call on uh, Brother Farrell Ford to... Uh, Come forward, please, and to uh, pray for Brother Corey and pray for the church. We certainly thank you, Brother Corey, for your leadership, for your godly influence, and for your zeal for the Word of God. And we are so thankful for you and all of your family. Brother Farrell. I told him I didn't want to do this. Because it's hard. I prayed about what I should pray about. Have you ever done that? God, I didn't know what to say, and I still don't know what to say, but under your leadership. So the Lord, and I'm saying the Lord told me this. He told me to remind us that over the last three years in this church, there's been a lot of transition. God called Bob a few years back to another place. And so we began to pray about a youth minister. Some of you remember this well. God sent us J.P. Later on, Brother Guy retired. What are we going to do? God sends us Michael to his family. Then the woe of old knees began because Kim said she was leaving. Oh, my God. I heard it more about her than I did them. But you all know why. 
All these people. We have blessed this church in so many ways. And God used them. And so Kim tells us she's leaving. But guess what, Kim? You've been replaced. <laughs> God has sent us two wonderful ladies. to take over her responsibilities. And I've forgotten what I'm saying. (laughs) I know it's Rachel. Amanda. Forgive me, Amanda. And they're doing an awesome job. JB is doing an awesome job. Not because of JB, but because of God. Michael's doing a great job. It's not because of him, but it's because of God. And these ladies are doing an awesome job. And now that Corey has listened to God, <laughs> well, I wonder about this one. I want to tell you something. God told me to remind you, and I'm serious about when I tell you that God told me this, because I've been praying for this two days after after uh, Brad called me. Brad called me. And uh, I was on my knees this morning. I said, Lord, I don't know what to say to these people. But God said, you need to encourage them. Let them know this is not the end, that this is only the beginning. For in the weeks to come, there will be men on this platform preaching the word of God. The men of God preaching the word of God for the glory of God. And so he instructed me to share two things with you. The first is, be faithful. Be faithful. This is no time to decide to go in other directions. We are the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is our leader. And I believe... Not that he couldn't use Corey to do this. But God has said to Corey, I'm through with you here. That's just the way it is. And we need to understand that. God knows what's going on. He's got a plan. But he also has another man coming in. And over the last 11 years, I believe since I've been here, and I've been here 30 years, God has blessed this church, I believe personally, in the last 11 years, more than I've ever seen it blessed. And I believe that now God is preparing a man to come and fill this pulpit, to to take us further as the Star Trek movie says, than we've ever gone before. Y'all watched that movie, hadn't you? And that's what God's going to do. God has finished the work for Corey. Now, he's going to be here. But he's he's got a new beginning somewhere else. And so I want to encourage you. I don't want you to be downhearted. I want you to be uplifted. If I can remember Joshua 1 9, it says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear or be dismayed. That's King James. <laughs> For I'm with you wherever you go and in whatever you do. So, church, let's be encouraged. 
uh, let's be let's rejoice. Let's just praise God for what He's done, and let's praise God even more so about what He's going to do. And I say to God, be the glory. Now, if any of you guys want to come up here and lay hands on this little boy, y'all come on. And uh, we're going to pray for him. Ladies can join to it, they like. But let's pray together. Father God, there's no words to express the feelings in this church right now. Father, for me, it's, and I say this in all honesty, Lord, it, to me, it's feel like just even a death, because I love this man so much. But, Father, you've called him to another place and another time. And so, Father, we pray for him and his family, that God, as he goes, that he'll be going in the power of the Holy Spirit, that he'll have the anointing of God upon his life, and, Father God, that you'll use him in greater and mighty ways at that blessed church that he's going to. I pray for that church. I pray for that church that they'll love him as we do. I pray, Father, that they'll follow his leadership as we have. Father, I pray that, God, you'll be glorified through the ministry of that church. Just bless him and bless his family. May you anoint him, Lord, in a special way. And may you use him, Father, for your honor and glory. Help him to hear your voice and to speak to his heart that he might or share the gospel in the ways that he shared it here. Father, I pray for the people here. Lord, this is not the end. This is only the beginning. God, you've got a great plan in mind for Eldale Baptist Church. And so, Father, help us to be mindful that we stand on a firm foundation. And that firm, that firm foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church in the gates of hell and then we'll prevail against it. And, God, we love you. And we pray your blessings upon Corey and Wendy, and the children, and that church. But, Father, I pray are your blessings upon this church and this leadership, Father. And I pray, God, that we'll band together, that we'll encourage our, our staff, and that our deacons will, will work together with them, Father, and that, that, Lord, we'll go forward for the glory of God. Be honored, be blessed, be glorified, because we love you. And we praise you, and we thank you, Father, for the great mercy you've shown all of us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.